Good morning. I'm Maura Marks. I'm the director of the DPLA Secretariat at the Berkman Center at Harvard. And before we uh, continue with the program, we have another special announcement to make this morning. This one is about interoperability, which we've heard a lot about this morning. And it's really about the potential of the DPLA to be a player in a, in a truly global information infrastructure. And to that end, uh, first thanks to Dame Lynn Brindley for her words this morning. But now we've asked Jill Cousins, the director of the Europeana Foundation, to actually make the announcement. So Jill. Long walk, long walk. Um, I, I make this announcement actually on behalf of both uh, Europeana and uh, the DPLA. I feel very, very, very privileged uh, to be here at the launch of the DPLA. It's a wonderful vision. Um, and with the energy that all of you have um, and you are putting into it, it's going to happen. At Europeana, uh, we've done some of the things that you are starting and you're very welcome to reuse all of that as it will help us move forward and um, uh, so it helped both of us. I'd like uh, certainly the DPLA not to reinvent the wheel, uh, but to move the cart forward, um, add another few other wheels, uh, gain some traction and some speed, learn from our mistakes, um, but make something bigger and better for all of us to share. Um, we already share a common goal, and to make, which is to make the riches of libraries, museums, archives, and audiovisual collections available free of charge to everyone. And in this mission, we've set out some principles to follow between the DPLA and Europeana. The first is to make our systems and data interoperable. The second is to promote openness and open access through policies and action on content, data, and metadata. And the third is to develop collaboratively where we can. So beginning with an interoperable data model. Actually, if you can say that, you're doing well. <laughs> uh, and I'd very much like you to start with the Europeana data model. I can't tell you the pain and years that have gone into it already. Um, it's based on linked open data, and it's a, a beginning. Um, to share our source codes and to cooperatively collect, um, build our collections together. And to prove that this is not just talk, uh, we are starting by doing something very concrete that showcases the content and links our continents. It's a virtual exhibition about the migration of Europeans to America. The DPLA and Europeana will demonstrate the potential of their combined collections by digitizing and making freely available material about the journey from the old world to the new. This exhibition will include texts and images about the experiences of the uprooted as they abandoned their homes to seek a new life thousands of miles across a treacherous ocean. Letters, photographs, and official records open up unfamiliar views into the harsh world inhabited by Europeans from the Shetland communities of Russia to the peasant villages of Ireland. And equally vivid testimonies illustrate the culture shock and the hard lot of the immigrants after their arrival. Everyone in the United States, including the Amerindians, descend from immigrants, and nearly everyone in Europe has some connection with migration, either within Europe itself or across the ocean. All will be invited to stroll digitally through this rich exhibition, and most importantly, to interact and participate as users, adding their own stories and memorabilia. Thank you. Now, we're so excited to begin this work. And uh, just a word of thanks to Professor Robert Darton for all the work he's done building ties with our other European partners. So thank you, Bob. And now back to your regular scheduled, scheduled programming. I give you Maureen Sullivan, the president-elect of the uh, American Library Association. Good morning. I have the privilege here this morning of moderating a panel of these distinguished individuals, each of whom has been invited 
to, from their own perspective, address the question, what is the DPLA? And particularly what we've asked them to do is to share some of their vision of what the DPLA might be, but also to offer their perspectives on the promise of the DPLA. The format is each of them has been invited to speak to us for five to seven minutes, and I will move things along to ensure that that happens to allow a sufficient amount of time for their engagement with you. And I also want to acknowledge, as was done previously, that we have an audience that goes beyond this room. That is, there are individuals throughout the country who are being a part of this, but who are more in a listening mode. Those of you who are here in this room have the opportunity to actually engage the way you saw earlier today. We're going to go in order. And they're seated in the order in which they're listed in the program. And we're going to begin with John Palfrey, whom all of you now fully recognize as the chair of the DPLA. Great. John. Maureen, thank you so much. Um, and before I uh, do the kind of official what is the DPLA uh, five minutes, I want to uh, acknowledge Tony Marks, the uh, incoming president, new president of the New York Public Library, who's joined us as well, um, a great partner in this effort, one that hasn't yet been mentioned, but uh, I think will be a huge piece of this going forward. Tony, welcome and thank you. Um, so what is the DPLA? This has been a complex and occasionally vexing question. Um, the honest answer is we're building it. This is a bridge that we're building as we walk over it in virtual terms. And we have really by design sought to build it together rather than to say here's a particular vision of what it must be. Um, but I think in this uh, sort of straightforward way, I want to describe five aspects of what the DPLA will be. And we can uh, work further on what the concrete aspects of each of those uh, will be, but um, let me just hit them all. They're up on the screen. Um, and these are the areas where we know after 18 months of our uh, planning phase and then moving forward, we will have gotten some uh, work done and that we will uh, aim for further uh, work from there. Um, we've talked a lot about content that's in the middle of this list, and I think that is clearly part of the DPLA. We will be digitizing materials. We'll be doing um, with European this wonderful uh, initial project around immigration, a series of other demonstrations. I hope we'll work with the Internet Archive and Hathi Trust and lots of others, New York Public Library, to digitize content. Um, I don't think the idea is that it will be one big, massive digital library in one place, but rather um, a collection of uh, collections and um, it's something we'll have to figure out how preservation happens over time and so forth. But I think even from the perspective of low-hanging fruit, if we were as institutions that together spend millions and millions of dollars digitizing every year to do it in a common way based on a common standard or platform, maybe if funders like NEH and others as they fund these discrete efforts were to ask people to use a common format and then to share, make sure that a copy of it were shared with the DPLA or a partner organization like Hathi Trust, I think we could do a huge amount just there by making the existing collections uh, and content much more, uh, much more uh, interoperable and, uh, and common, uh, in common formats. Um, but I think it's much more than just the, the digitized materials. Um, starting from the top of the list is code. So very importantly, I think the DPLA is computer code that we are developing. We've made a commitment to do things as much as possible on an open source basis. Um, the DPLA will be a set of code. I think of it sort of like source forge for libraries in a sense. There are many um, uh, uh, ways in which others are working on this, this effort. But the DPLA itself will be the um, repository of a bunch of code that anybody can take and reuse in many different ways. So I could imagine that a future would be a dp.la website where people could come and access the content, but also a bunch of code that a public library might take and repurpose for its own use so that it could curate collections. Perhaps um, one of our partner libraries, Darien Public Library, just as an example, might take that code, repurpose it for the Darien um, Public Library website, bring some of the content um, that we've got in our collection and, and uh, curate it locally. Um, a second thing that's part of that same mix is the metadata. Dame Lynn Brindley mentioned this before. I think we in the information business know that it's one thing to digitize, to scan materials. It's quite another to make it findable and useful. And this really is, in many ways, the special, special sauce of what librarians and information professionals know how to do so well. Um, but it's something that I think we haven't structured right yet in the world of libraries information. I think information in the form of metadata has been too locked up. So I think we're going to make a real contribution by having open access to metadata very broadly through this proje project. And um, we've heard um, earlier today about efforts to uh, make link open data and to make 
um, information more broadly available in this form. So the DPLA is and will be metadata available in an open way. There's a pilot project called Library Cloud, which um, you may hear reference later, which is a version of what this could look like. Um, going down the list to the tools and services, this is the part where I think it's most playful and exciting in some respects. The DPLA has the possibility not just to be kind of a common platform in code, but also a series of tools and services that libraries and others could use to make um, this information richer and more available and to bring people in to allow social media um, to mix with this. I see my friends who are working on Extra Muros, which I think would be an example of tools and services that might ride on top of a common platform. Um, one of my favorite uh, examples of this, where's Emily Gore? Is Emily Gore here? I'm so pleased to meet Emily Gore because she uh, coined the term Scanabago. I love the idea of the Scanabago, and I am totally committed to having Scanabagos, <laughs> at least one, running around the country um, with a yeah, scanner in the back and going to local historical societies, going to the Georgetown County Library, going to the Pratt Library in Baltimore, and saying, bring out your scans. Let's do this together. There's material out here that hasn't yet been put in this um, uh, wonderful cloud that we're developing and metadata around it. Um, I could see this totally working with carlslaw.gov. We've got to get Scanabagos out there, and I think that's part of what the DPLA could be. Um, and uh, I think we've um, got an extra metadata up on this slide, so I'm going to put the real thing, which is supposed to be there, which is community. Um, and I think um, the DPLA is us. We are the DPLA. It is uh, an amazing, rich, occasionally cranky, um, occasionally contentious community, um, but a community that I think has a public spirit behind it and will work together um, as institutions and as individuals, hopefully always with common respect and a common goal in mind uh, to build something that no one institution could build on its own. I think when we heard from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian and National Archives and others, there is no one place that could do the DPLA as well as we all can. There are many people who have come to me and said, you will fail because this tent is too big. And I say that's wrong. I say that if we structure this right and we actually have goodwill and we trust one another and we work hard, um, the visions that have been made possible by Wikipedia, the IETF, the web itself, I think we can do the same thing in the library world. And that, to me, is what the DPLA is. And now we have an opportunity to hear from Peggy Rudd, who leads the Texas State Library and Archives Commission and also serves on the steering committee for the DPLA. Peggy? Thanks, Maureen. I feel like driving the Scanabago would be a job for a retired librarian. So, I want to be in the uh, back. Can I be in the back? You can be in the <laughs> back, <you>. John. <laughs> I think it's particularly uh, important that we are here at the National Archives uh, for this plenary session because this is, in fact, National Archives Month. So we are celebrating all of the archives held at the national, state, and local level throughout our country. Um, I, uh, and, and we do have our own um, Declaration of Independence that's on display in Austin, Texas right now, and it is digitized and available on the web. Um, I think so many of us have been focusing on content, as well we should, because we want to know what is this thing called the DPLA going to look like. But it also has to do with the tools that John was talking about yesterday in one of the planning sessions that um, uh, uh, Carla and I were uh, hosting. Uh, someone said they want to see somebody walking down the sidewalk and they've got their cell phone and they've got a question and they say to themselves, I'm going to DPLA it. Okay? <laughs> Just the way they say, Google it now. That's what we want to see. And if we take as our guiding principle something that uh, Chairman Leach said earlier, which I really uh, just loved, and that is the infrastructure of ideas. If we take as our guiding principle that all people in this country should have access to this infrastructure of ideas, then one of the issues we've got to deal with, in addition to all the things that John said, the metadata, the content, the tools and services, and the community, not just the community of those that are going to be involved in building the DPLA, but those that are going to be involved in sharing what is built. Um, we've got to think about access. And I think that many of us who represent public libraries, even though I am 
a state librarian, um, we do uh, a lot of work, as do state libraries all across this country, with the infrastructure of more than 16,000 public library outlets in this country. We have a built infrastructure, and we're very proud of that built infrastructure. And we think that in terms of access for people who are, whose lives are going to be improved by having access to the DPLA, we are going to be the digital literacy core. Those of us in public libraries, I think about the work that's being done in the U Media Centers in Chicago at the Chicago Public Library. I think about the work that Carla Hayden is doing at Enoch Pratt right here in neighboring Baltimore. I think about the uh, youth centers that um, have been going for uh, a decade now with Dell uh, Foundation funding in Austin, Texas at the public library there. Libraries, public libraries are going to be the institutions that ensure that not only can people discover things, that they can efficiently and effectively discover things in this wonderful thing that we are all going to build together, but they also are going to help people evaluate what it is they find. They're going to ensure that what they find is relevant to whatever their purpose is and help them get the most out of the digital public library of America. I think we are all committed to digital inclusion and we understand that this is a major challenge. It's a challenge now in our country and public libraries have risen to that challenge and I think they will continue to do so. But I would submit that what we build is going to be grand and glorious. Many of us have already built components that are going to enrich the Digital Public Library of America. And we are all committed to bringing this to fruition. But we must remember that there are those in our country that will need our special assistance for a whole variety of reasons to make sure that they can use this tremendous resource that we're all committing to today. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And next we have an opportunity to hear from Brewster Kale with the Internet Archive. Being from California, I have to have PowerPoint or you know, something. Um, We've got a tie on Brewster. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when in Rome. Um, <laughs> oh. I think it's on the back. I grew up in a paper America. I believe we are in the transition of building the digital America. And this project uh, is a key component to it. I believe the archivist is right. If it's not online, it doesn't exist. And a lot of the materials that are necessary to bring up, well, the next generation, and frankly, inform our own generation, uh, are locked up in our physical paper libraries and not accessible. This isn't good enough, uh, and this project can be a major step uh, towards fixing this. There are two um, digital library projects that are now, um, excuse me, um, uh, operating in the United States. Um, and they're fairly large scale, um, and there are many, many smaller ones. There's a 10 million book uh, collection that's offered as a subscription service, um, but there are some contractual litigation limitations on that collection. There's a smaller collection of uh, about 2 million books that's now available um, for free public access for the, uh, for the public domain materials and a free public lending library, which we find very in an interesting uh, approach towards moving forward. But let's step back. What are we actually looking for? What do we want? Um, and if we sort of take this as a, a, a new starting point, um, where, where are we really trying to get to? Well, let's make sure that we have, at the end of the day, lots and lots of publishers that are paid. Let's make sure there are lots of authors, lots of booksellers, many, many libraries 
that are not all responsible to central control, that there's a, a, a diversity of every one of these, many to many to many. Lots of authors, many of which can get paid. Um, and last of all, let's make sure that everyone can be a reader, no matter what their language, their disabilities, uh, um, and proclivities, that everyone can be supported in this digital world. Frankly, it's the world that we benefited from growing up. Let's make sure that the next generation has, even though, as you look around this room, the number of laptops that are open, it's a digital world uh, now. Let's go and adapt to it and support it and build it. First of all, let's go and get, say, a, a library that's as great as the Boston Public Library, a Yale or a Princeton Library, online and accessible to all. This is materials that are public domain, out of print, and in print. Those libraries are about on the order of 10 million volumes. We can't stop there, but let's make sure that we do this, and I think we can do this quite effectively. About 2 million books that are public domain, 7 million out of print, and 1 million in print. I would suggest there are three strategies for these different uh, legal categories. One, public domain should stay free. Um, the, and out of print can be digitized to be lent. Digitized to be lent, digitally lent. And that's now in, in process and happening at scale. And now there's also in print, let's buy ebooks and lend them. This isn't always what the publishers are saying they want us to be able to do, but we have billions of dollars collectively in the library system to buy books. And let's go and do what it is we're used to doing, which is acquire things for our collections permanently and lend them out such that if we buy 100 copies, there can be 100 copies circulating at once. So buy ebooks and then lend them, digitize the books that we can't buy and lend them and give away uh, the public domain. This is, um, I'm happy to say that this is happening at scale. Um, there are now a thousand libraries that have digitized books that are modern books in copyright books and lending them digitally. And this is, and also they're uh, sharing about 100,000 books. Now you say, well, is that at scale? I'd say that's moving by having a large number of libraries saying we're moving forward with this uh, approach of digitally lending and sort of solving one of the key problems, which is how do we get the collections that are not commercially viable up online? And then how do we go and support a wide number of vendors uh, going forward? What can this project do? The th my dreams out of this project is to help libraries buy new ebooks so that they can lend them. We can scan the core collection of 10 million books that should be available to every citizen everywhere in the world, uh, but since this has America in the title, at least the United States. And the third is help all libraries get the complete digital collections. What's been amazing to me is to, if you wanted a 10 million volume collection, the size of that collection, if it were on spinning, searchable hard drives, is two computers that are about this size. <laughs> A 10 million book collection, downloadable, servable, costs about $30,000. That's within the budget of a lot of libraries. And I think they'll take very different use of it. And it's a different conception than having one centralized database, which might have been necessary in the mainframe era, but is no longer necessary. What would we get? We would get universal access to all knowledge for an inspiring generation. We would be doing our part towards going and building the infrastructure that people all over the world and our fellow citizens can learn from. How do we stay on track? I always uh, try to follow the money. Is it being efficiently spent towards building towards these goals? Or is it kind of, well, spent? Um, so I would, I, I'm always looking to follow the money and follow the bits. Are the resulting bits going to be put in lots of libraries or just in one place? The thing I love about this project is that it's committing to put the bits in many places, even if they're in copyright materials, because libraries can handle copyrighted materials on their shelves in new and different ways. Together, we can build a digital America that, as it's carved above the door of the Boston Public Library, that's free to all. Thank you very much. Amanda French from the Center for History and New Media is next. Busy old fool, unruly son. 
Why dost thou thus, through windows and through curtains, call on us? Saucy, pedantic wretch, go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. Call country ants to harvest offices. Love, all alike, no season knows, nor clime, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. It's John Dunn, The Sun Rising. The Obad is a lyric about lovers parting at morning. Its opposite and counterpart is the serenade, an evening song in which one lover greets another. Serenade has somehow become a far more common word in English than Obad. They used to rhyme. Uh, but we are familiar enough with the scene of the Obad as when Romeo and Juliet argue over whether that's a lark or a nightingale they hear at the close of their night together or when John Donne berates the annoying dawn in the sun rising. The Obad is a slightly inverted genre. It recognizes that in the world of work, the sun's rising is a beginning, while for lovers, the sun's rising is an unwelcome ending. Those of us who love books, reading, and the library, three separate ideas that are associated but not congruent, of course, are now somewhat in the position of a lover tangled up in someone's warm limbs at dawn. The unruly sun of the digital text is rising, and it is calling us to plodding work, to the daily ballet of bureaucracy, when I, for one, would far rather snuggle down under the covers with a book, or with my beloved ideals about books, reading, and the library. My love song for the library as we have known it would praise, first of all, the fact that the library's favors cost me nothing. As early modern poetry would be the first to admit, it is perfectly possible that love can exist in a, shall we say, commercial relationship. <laughs> but I am speaking here of ideals. <laughs> Secondly, I would praise a library's infinite variety, from Robert Browning to Nora Roberts, a plenitude that custom cannot stale. Thirdly, I appreciate a library that will support me in my moods of contemplative repose, as well as in my moods of raucous communion. All these might be called aspects of the soul of a library, a so the soul of a library I could love, of libraries I have loved. But my love is not platonic. As Dunn writes in another poem, to our bodies turn we then, that so weak men in love revealed may look. Love's mysteries in souls do grow, but yet the body is his book. We need proof of love. Entire coffee table books have been compiled with nearly erotic photos of gorgeous library buildings, cathedrals of culture. How will the DPLA be embodied? I think the DPLA must manifest itself as more than just a website. There must also be many largely hidden and quiet services as well, generous services to the public, to developers, to existing libraries. These services must be both technical and social, and might include some of the things we've already heard about today, <coughs> linked open data and metadata, APIs, persistent URIs or DOIs, preservation services, perhaps in the form of its own repository, um, literacy and reference services, um, and uh, I think you know, continual attention to accessibility and discoverability, and even policy work at the highest levels of national government. A site that merely aggregates existing content without providing such services would seem to me like a Galatea, a mere lovely statue with no real humanity beyond what we project upon it. And although I, I fully agree with um, those who say if it isn't online, it doesn't exist, um, I think that something that is only online perhaps only half exists. And I want a building a public building, not just a data center, not just a warehouse. I do not need a building, but I want it with the irrational desire of a lover. I know that it's not on the radar yet for the DPLA, but I wanted to plant the seed of that idea today. Um, a monument to the ideal of an informed citizenry, but also a monument to a culturally, intellectually, and emotionally enriched citizenry. We're in the city of monuments. Um, we're in a marvelous monument to those ideals today. One important note about the Obad in closing. 
Lovers who plan to reunite in the evening of the very same day on which they part so reluctantly in the morning are allowed to figure in the Obad. You can look this up in the Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics. <laughs> it's not just for lovers who anticipate a long, painful, and perhaps permanent separation. I am confident that ours is one such Obad, that our own workday will end with a, with a gleeful rendezvous with the soul and body of a library. There have been many memorable phrases throughout this, but this last one, the gleeful rendezvous <laughs> with the soul and body of a library, is one to remember. We had the privilege at the start of this session of hearing Jill Cousins describe the commitment of Europeana to the Digital Public Library of America. We now have the opportunity to hear some of her perspectives on the vision and the promise of the DPLA. They are entirely selfish, um, and I, I'm not Californian, but I can't do anything without slides. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to subject you to the slides. Do we have a, yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to attempt to make the technology work. Oops, yeah, why do I want it? Well, let's go back. The importance of the DPLA to Europeana, it's really, really selfish, actually. Um, we can get access to your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I am prepared to give you access to your stuff that we hold back. <laughs> um, and there is a lot more besides. Um, I also think that you can improve on Europeana. Um, it's about open data, open source, open licensing. Open licensing is my latest mantra, and I'll come back to that. It is about being interoperable with each other, so that together we can give the user on both sides of the Atlantic more, and we can give it to them faster. So this is Europeana. Um, this year we launched a strategic plan and this strategic plan is for four years, and it's got, so I can read it, uh, four major strands. And the reason for pushing this on you, um, I apologize, I'm pushing this on you. Uh, the reason for pushing this on you is that it helps me frame what it is that I want out of the DPLA. So Europeana is about aggregating. It is about uh, building the open, trusted source to European cultural content. It is about facilitating, supporting cultural heritage um, sector through knowledge, transfer through advocacy. It is about making the heritage available to users wherever they are, wherever they want it. And lastly, it is about engaging that user um, in ways to participate with our cultural heritage. Now, I've heard all of that already here this morning and yesterday. It is exactly the same mission that you are trying to accomplish. Um, when I look at these numbers, I'm slightly, I, th I was quite proud, actually. I thought we'd gone from 2 million to 20 million in, in three years. I thought that was quite good. And then I hear the numbers that you guys are talking about, and I think, hey, I'll have some of that, please. <laughs> um, but we're, we're doing OK. Uh, we started very much as you have started, and uh, we're moving on. <coughs> the thing that I'm particularly interested in is the APIs. It's to be able to distribute this content back um, into the places where the user is going to use it. So don't expect them to come to Europeana. I don't think I would expect them to come to the DPLA. DPLA uh, DPLA, you see, you can't say Europeana, but I can't do <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you, you shouldn't expect them to come to those sites. We need to put the stuff through APIs where the user is. So the, the curators of a school site can actually make it work for the kids. We're not going to be able to do that. We don't have the uh, capability unless we put it uh, with people who can make that, um, that, that kind of thing work. Um, it is about uh, being able to take back uh, what already belongs to America through these APIs. This is a search um, on, it's actually America, United States, Etats Unis, Verenigde Staten, 
Um, so just three uh, languages. And it brings up the kind of content that relates to uh, the USA on that. So it is maps. It's Christmas cards, which seem to have been invented here. It is um, quite a lot of uh, archive material, particularly after the, uh, the Second World War. But it's also things like videos of people turning up at Ellis Island, which is kept in the Institut National Audiovisuel in Paris. All of that belongs to you, and you should have it back in the DPLA. Um, that came to, to 92,320. Now, facilitate. The reason that I am interested in this is all to do with open, open data, open licensing. We've heard some of that already. Uh, we're doing an awful lot of work on labeling the content so that you know that it is in the public domain. We issued a charter that says what was in the public domain in analog form should stay in the public domain in uh, digital form. And I need your help to make sure that goes on, that we label it with the public domain uh, mark, which has been developed with uh, the Creative Commons guys here, and that we really make sure that we don't lose this stuff uh, for the future. This was a search on Washington. And the public domain items actually are only 36 relating to Washington, but there were some on there. And this one is from the National Archive in the Netherlands. And it's a song about uh, George Washington, I think, when he went to Leiden, but I wouldn't swear about that. <laughs> and it's in Dutch, so unless you can read Dutch, you're fine. Lastly, it's about being able to engage. And some of you will have heard um, me wax lyrical about a project that we are involved in. It's called Europeana 1914 to 1918. It's uh, based on an idea that came out of Oxford University. And with it, we go around um, museums, libraries, and ask people to bring in their memorabilia of the First World War. And they bring in all sorts of stuff. Uh, photos with bullet holes um, through them that they got back from the, the Uncle Bert who was killed in Passchendaele. They get back, you get uh, diaries, you get diaries kept by children during that period. You get pick helmets. All of that is digitized with the story and it's put online. And we've done that in Germany. We're going around the rest of Europe. I would really like to be able to extend that. And if you'd like to take the next exhibition that we do after migration and hit 2014 with one that looks at the stories behind uh, the First World War. And there's a rather nice remix video uh, which is based on this and pulls in all of the items that we hold in our institutions into the video. So it's a story about a prisoner of war, a German prisoner of war, and a uh, captain in the British Army who together put out a fire um, in an ammunition stump in St. Omer. And in this story, in this video, you can start to pull in things from YouTube. You can start to put in the maps um, of the trenches, all of those things, as you read through the video. So the aim is to make it very interactive. So why is DPLA important? We are the generation that can give access to the analog past. Brewster said this. I and a couple of other speakers have said it. We were brought up on books, manuscripts, phonograms, pictures. We visited the museums, the libraries, the archives, the galleries. We know what is there and how important it is. Will our kids? if we don't digitize it and we don't put it online. For me, that's the reason why the DPLA is such a fantastic idea. Thank you. Thank you. And the person rising is Carl Malamud with peopleresource.org, coming to the podium. Thank you. I'm from California. I don't believe in PowerPoint, but I do want a soapbox. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank David Ferriero for allowing us to occupy NARA today, uh, Maura Marx, and uh, John Palfrey, of course, for working for the last year to make this real, and especially to uh, Bob Darton, who's been our prophet here, to uh, leading us to the promised land of the Republic of Letters, uh, 
Bless me, professor, for I have scanned. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I think about a digital public library of America, I keep seeing images of reservoirs and bridges. When I think of the DPLA, I think of the Hoover Dam and the Golden Gate Bridge. If you look at our museums and you look at our archives and our research institutions, there's a tremendous reservoir of knowledge that's locked up waiting to be tapped. It's tempting to think that our world of knowledge, born digital, that we're flooded with information, that we need what Clay Johnson calls an information diet. We don't need more data. But our internet is only flooded with some kinds of information right now, and some of our most important pools of knowledge are not available to all, or available only to those with gold credit cards or positions of privilege in our elite institutions. Knowledge in our world does belong to the 1%. And I can give you two examples, and I think you can probably think of many more. The first is law and government. The law our court opinions, our statutes, our regulations, our public safety codes. It's the operating system of our society. It's the rules that make our democracy work. It's the code that makes America such a special place. But private fences have enclosed this most public of public domains. Access to justice has become all about access to money. Let me give you one other example. If you're a creative worker, if you're a writer, a filmmaker, if you're an artist, a scholar, you draw on imagery that has accumulated over thousands of years, imagery you use to create new works of art and scholarship. Creative workers must stand on the shoulders of giants if they're to reach new heights. But as any Hollywood filmmaker will tell you, much of that imagery is locked up in for-profit collections like Getty Images or Corbis or other operations that have taken public domain materials and they've built walls and gates around them. Even our museums, even our National Smithsonian Institution have locked up their vaults, allowing the images to be used only by those who stop by a cash register first. There's a tremendous reservoir of this untapped knowledge in America. Knowledge is our country's most important renewable natural resource. It's a common pool that should be available to all. We already have many beautiful museums. We have bottomless libraries. We have unique research institutions. What if the DPLA, instead of simply creating yet another institution, created a common reservoir that we could all tap into? What if the Hathi Trust put everything they have into a common pool, a pool that they, in turn, could draw upon to create an even more impressive Hathi Trust? What if the Internet Archive and the Library of Congress and public libraries and individuals and local historical societies could all draw on those deep wells and all contribute to that common pool? It's tempting for any one institution to say, I have the answer. But what if we shift the debate so that it becomes we all have the answer. Here's my contributions. See what you can do with it. Surprise me. I have one more metaphor, and then I'm going to stop beating this metaphorical horse, as it were. And that metaphor is a bridge. And the specific bridge I think of is a Washington bridge, a bridge that connects our nation's capital to the rest of the country. When it comes to untapped resources, Washington is the deepest well. It's a vast storehouse locked inside this beltway. Look at our national cultural institutions, our Library of Congress, the National Library of Medicine, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Agricultural Library, the National Technical Information Service, the Government Printing Office, the National Archives, the list goes on. While we have glimpsed a few shining examples of that potential, the American Memory Project from the Library of Congress, the pioneering National Library of Medicine, for the most part, those resources lay hidden. Our opportunity is to build a bridge to Washington, and that means we need to get much more serious about public works projects for knowledge. We need to start a national digitization initiative that is more than pilots and prototypes. We need a decade-long commitment to scanning. We need our federal government to understand that it's time to deploy the Internet Corps of Engineers to scan at stale, to become a much more serious contributor to that reservoir of knowledge, to be at the center 
of that public park that makes access to knowledge a right for all Americans, not a privilege for the 1%. If a self-appointed librarian in an abandoned church like Brewster Kale can publish three million books, how can our federal government not do more? If Google can scan 10 million books just to feed its search engine, why can't the federal government do the same to transform our nation's educational system? If Westlaw can scan the opinions of our courts and statutes of our legislatures to maximize shareholder value, why can't the Judicial Conference of the United States and our nation's law schools work together to maximize democratic values? If we can put a man on the moon, why can't we launch the Library of Congress into cyberspace? If we spend billions of dollars to buy access to politicians, why can't we spend billions of dollars to buy access to knowledge and justice to promote the useful arts, commerce, and science? That, I think, is the challenge that we face. And these are the kinds of bridges and reservoirs we can build, the kinds of public projects that can become the foundation of the Digital Public Library of America it's the opportunity we can realize, but only if we work together. Thank you. As the moderator of this panel this morning, I'm going to exercise the privilege of moving to audience participation on this question. And rather than invite you to comment on what you've heard from the six, instead, reflect for a few moments on the wealth of information and ideas that have been shared here. And I'd like you to consider, what is the potential of the DPLA in the communities of which you are a part? And then I would invite you to share that with all of us here this morning. What is the potential that you see? And oh, I should, forgot one other thing. Would you please state your name and be brief? <laughs> Claire McInerney, Rutgers University. As a faculty member at a library school, I'm hoping that the DPLA will have some fellowships or some scholarships to help the upcoming librarians learn all the skills that they need. We've already launched courses in digital libraries, metadata, data curation, but we need more and we need to be on the front line. Thank you, Claire. I'm well aware of the richness among the six here, but there's richness in this audience. Thank you. I'm sorry, Fisher. I'm the uh, director of the Berkman Center. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a passionate supporter of this project. Uh, the presentations this morning, however, have exposed an issue that hadn't occurred to me before, so I'd like to make a suggestion about it. The, the um, refrain, um, which surprised me, was the proposition that if it doesn't exist online, it doesn't exist. Um, this seems to me, um, if true, unfortunate. There are aspects of our uh, cultural heritage that um, can never be fully appreciated in a digital format. Um, graphic art uh, can be um, suggested, but never uh, imitated online. Um, fine musical performances. Uh, and certain historical events, uh, appreciation of the Holocaust can't be fully gleaned from digital materials. Uh, at a minimum, one has to immerse oneself in, say, the um, texture of Yad Vashem. So if um, the digital public library succeeded fully, there is a hazard I hadn't previously recognized that it would um, suppress our appreciation of some other aspects of our cultural heritages. Uh, Two paths forward. One is there's this an unavoidable competition, and we would um, observe and regret the extent to which our children lose appreciation for some things that we did enjoy. 
But there's an alternative path, which is one could build into the project from the beginning uh, techniques, uh, not just for digitizing currently um, analog materials, but providing access to and indices for analog material to sensitize uh, appreciation of. This can be as simple as a guidance to where musical performances currently are located, uh, or it could be something more fundamental. Thank you. You actually, interestingly enough, were addressing the second question I was going to pose if there had been time, and that is, what would any of you suggest are important things to consider as this work moves forward, critical success factors? I appreciate that. Other perspectives on the promise of the DPLA for your communities? Ah, Martin, thank you. Martin, Martin Gomez, uh, Los Angeles Public Library. I see potential for many of the kids that are served by the Los Angeles Public Library, an example, to get excited about knowledge, about information, about learning, about pulling pieces together that are important to them in their own communities. Thank you. Yes? Zachary Davis from the Cannon Foundation. And I'm very interested to know how the DPLA is planning to support local libraries so that with the online uh, library systems, how do we make sure that public libraries continue to be a space for learning and education? How can we transform the use of public libraries in these communities so that these buildings can become you know, potential temples to knowledge and a, and a place of, well, that's the idea. What do we do with these places so that they're still useful? Wonderful. Well, Peggy. I'll, I'll take a, a crack at that. Um, I, I think that um, Susan Hildreth uh, sort of alluded to this in her um, presentation earlier this morning. And I think um, what we're seeing is that public libraries may in fact have to uh, evolve. Um, and many of them are already doing that. I think um, one of the, the exciting features that I envision for the Digital Public Library of America is that it will incorporate user-created content. Well, all of that is being fed in, if you will, laboratories in public libraries all across the country. Um, I was talking earlier about digital inclusion. Um, I think we have to realize that when you look at in a survey just came out, report uh, came out from Connected Nation that 46% of low-income families with children don't have computers and don't have internet access. And um, I think they deserve access to the Digital Public Library of America. And I, I would agree with Terry that I think if, if a child is growing up in some of the major cities in this country, there isn't always a digital replacement for a first-hand experience of a cultural event. But if you're a child growing up in Muleshoe, Texas, I can promise you the only cultural heritage organization or institution within 100 miles is the public library. So I, I think that public libraries are going to, to change. I, I think of it more <laughs> not a library without walls, but a library beyond walls, because I think every library in this country has experiences that they can share about uh, uh, all, the, all the ways that their libraries are being used in ways that, whether you're at Rutgers or University of Texas or Denver, whatever library school or iSchool you happen to go to, you could never have envisioned the use of the public library in that way. So I see public libraries as being integral to the development of DPLA because I think that is where user-created content is going to surface and is surfacing. But I also think that that's the role that libraries are going to play to create an environment in which people can access digital content when there is no access anywhere else. So I know I have one ready on this side, but is there anyone on that side? Ah, thank you. Hi. Um, 
Uh, I'm Suzanne Bramer. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, free for all is words that I pass every day um, on the face of the Boston Public Library. Ms. Rod, I really appreciate your comments because you, I, I signaled this fellow that I wanted to speak just as you were mentioning bandwidth. Um, which I think is a critical issue, particularly in rural areas. Um, and and I, I'm hoping that the technical aspects of working out digital public libraries takes into account that you're going to have a lot of data, uh, images, and, and very heavy use of the bandwidth. And how are we going to build um, the bandwidth access to, through public libraries? Well, I think that's one reason why I'm so glad to see Jill Nishi with the Gates Foundation here because they have worked with particularly libraries in my state of Texas, but also all across the country to upgrade bandwidth in public libraries and to sustain that over a period of time. Um, I think that is one of the critical issues that feeds into digital inclusion. Um, if your library has a 1.5 megabit um, connection and uh, you've got kids pouring into your library after three o'clock in the afternoon trust me it's not going to be long before everybody's saying why is it so slow why can't I do this that or the other so that is a key component of what we're talking about with DPLA is the gentleman here Uh, Stephen Kirkpatrick from SUNY Old Westbury. We serve many of uh, those underserved um, first generation to college students, and the word community means a great deal to us there. Uh, I, uh, and I, I think of community in, in two respects. Uh, imagine an Ecuadorian American mother who is a part time student uh, majoring in finance. She, uh, she actually belongs to a lot of communities. And we're, we want the content, of course, that serves all those communities. But I'd also be interested in making sure that the, the coding that goes into this recognizes that, well, not just her, but all of us have multiple communities that we belong to. So I would hope that whatever exists would allow her to shift from her parenting interests and, and get the advantage of social searching and then suddenly switch to the finance major and also have the benefit of the social aspect of searching uh, uh, with other finance majors, et cetera. Comment and then I'll call on this gentleman. Anyone? David, if you can come here. Anyone on the panel want to reflect on this? Yeah, I was going to say, we all agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Hi, my name's John Arnold. I'm a software engineer by trade, and I've been a library advocate since I was elected as a local library trustee when I was 19. So I've watched this whole thing develop, and I wanted to point out two, two, two things of interest that have caught my attention today. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the ideas hearkening way back to the 1991 White House Conference on Library Information Services, uh, which might be another reference point worth looking at, that we and some of our subgroups talked about, wasn't just scanning, but it was the ability to maybe have a central point where people could send their old home movies, like 8mm, Super 8, and not have to pay through the nose for not very good quality and be able to get some of those art activities that not only are in our families and, and in families across the country, but also many public libraries have films donated of parades from the turn of the century uh, or from World War II. So I'd like to get that. And the other thing I'd like to say, getting back to what uh, the question about the potential of DPLA, I see DPLA has a huge potential for freeing up some resources right now that are used at the local libraries so the local library can spend its scarce resources on customizing a broadly available set of content to exactly what that community needs and what the local trustees are deciding to do. But even better than that, having a great pool of lots of content to choose from, the library can customize it for the community, but if somebody feels they're not a good fit for that community, the library can provide an audience of one by letting the person customize the library for themselves. Thank you. That's great. My name um, is Elena Kemmelman. I'm a recent library um, science uh, graduate. Um, from New York, um, but my question is not really related to the professionals, library professionals, but more to 
how does the private citizen, the everyday person, get involved in this project from its beginning stages? And I'm not look, I'm not really asking about like the scanning part of it, but you know, <coughs> maybe getting involved somehow, writing letters to Washington, or even contributing funds. Great, John Palfrey is ready. <laughs> I'm thrilled to have this particular question, and we'll spend actually our last session on roughly this topic. Um, the answer is lots of ways, and your imagination is probably the real limit here. Um, I, I love the lobbying point that you, um, and second to last, I think that there's a big mobilization question here. I think it goes to many of the concerns that have been expressed, David Rothman and others, about the effect of this project on public libraries if this notion is that people say, because you have a DPLA, you therefore don't need a local library. Obviously, everyone in this room and everybody watching this thinks that's a crazy statement, but we know there are crazy people in politics, and <laughs> that's an unfortunate reality. We have to deal with it. So helping us get the word out about what this is and that it's a complement, a supplement to um, the real need to fund libraries at the local level and all through um, the system and to do that in a way that I think in the end aggregates more resources to this knowledge pool and the sort of system we're talking about and I, I don't think there's any, I would be so sorry if this project led to the closure of one library, right? I think to Terry Fisher's point and um, uh, other comments that have been uh, brought through here, this is absolutely not about shutting libraries. That is happening anyway. That doesn't have to be our fault. That is a problem in the world. Um, but th hopefully this will allow those spaces to be much richer and um, uh, used for more things and freeing up librarians' time. Um, more precisely, to giving money. I think we should find some way to have a fund that we all could give private resources to. We haven't done that, but it's a great idea. Thank you, and we'll figure that out, some PayPal mechanism. Um, uh, but more specifically to the, the, the kind of broad question, how can you get involved in the setting up of this project? I think the good news and bad news of having questions about what the it is of the DPLA is um, that uh, on the other hand, one hand we're struggling with it and we're working through it. On the other hand, that we want your help and we've got an opportunity to do that. There are six work streams that have been set up for the DPLA. If you go to um, dp.la or digitalpubliclibraryofamerica.org, which takes more typing, um, or Google us, you will find um, the six work streams. Um, today is in part meant as an invitation to everyone here and everybody watching this and everybody who will watch it in future to come join those work streams, to um, participate in the shaping of what this ought to be. Um, they range from governance to legal issues to technical aspects to audience and participation uh, and um, so forth. And there are going to be a series of meetings over 18 months that will um, be open to anyone who wants to participate. We'll post in advance when they're happening. Um, you can participate in virtual ways or come to the meetings. Um, they will be chaired and, um, in a way that hopefully we can manage relatively broad participation. And they will take up a series of issues that we know we have to deal with. So um, when we talk about what we're actually building, and I think Brewster's raised some of the key issues in that area, um, those who have more technical ability will be hugely helpful in that zone. Um, when we talk about how we take the beta sprints and build upon them into something common, but also take that open code and build on it not to do with the DPLA. Find funders who want to build it, you know, fund that, and people who want to build it uh, in other environments. Um, but on the technical aspects one, just to stick with that for a second, we also need people who will imagine the use cases. How will these things be used? Um, and what should we be building? So I think there's a huge, huge range of opportunities um, across these different projects. And if over the 18 months um, we have we come back together at April 2013, which is the um, will be the launch of a real DPLA itself. Um, if we have 300 people in the room, that will be great. Well, this was oversubscribed, so there would have been more. Um, but if we have you know 10 times that who want to be in here, that's going to be uh, a big piece of the success. And so to all library students, to everybody here, um, come join us. There's more than enough work to do. Um, and scanning's part of it. And riding in the back of the Scanabago will be fun. But there are lots of other things. Um, <laughs> in the work streams and more on that this afternoon. I'm sorry I took more no, than my wonderful. time, but this was a great opportunity to issue the invitation. I see one hand right here and I think we have time for that one. Oh, one up there. Hi, uh, okay, Contrasa Vargas Pyle. I'm an uh, early childhood fellow at University of Denver, second year library student, and uh, honored to be a former Enoch Pratt uh, <laughs> person, <laughs> uh, children's librarian. And you know, for me, I've always believed Children who go to the library become parents who go to the library. And so it's kind of a two-part question. What do you have in the collection for children? And I'm, and I'm talking about the emergent reader as well. 
And, and I want to know, what is the buy-in for a parent to want to use the Digital Public Library of America? Because I know that I see the, the reasons for academic, and it's very academic focused, and I see great for history. When I'm talking about that zero to eight years old, year old, and I know the amazing thing when they open a book for the first time. So what is it about the Digital Public Library of America that, want, that I, as a children's librarian, am going to tell my parent, this is an amazing resource, and this is why you should use it? And thank you for that, and we absolutely want the panel to respond, because we want to be very clear what the intent is of the DPLA. We'd like to take this one. I have an answer, which wow. I'd love to give, but okay. Peg, no, you do, no. will you do it? John, you okay. go right ahead. Um, so I think this is, like the last one, one of the crucial things that we kind of work out conceptually. Um, I think the answer to that is, it's what the Enoch <coughs> Library is going to do with the DPLA, and how it's going to mediate that in ways that are make sense for eight, zero to eight-year-olds who come to that library and through this. I think that is one big piece of this project is creating infrastructure, the common pool, however you want to describe it, of things that people can um, code upon and use in ways that um, are much richer and more freely available. I think that we do have to figure out if someone comes to the, some common website, how do we make it um, uh, something available? And I think you've heard from Brewster a vision for things that you would have had trouble accessing before. I, no, there are publishers in the room who are struggling with this question, but there are things that are um, digital and um, right now in print and in copyright that libraries are having a hard time getting to that zero to eight year old person. I think we fear a future in which a library can't even do its job to get the newest stuff to people. And I think we need to be a force broadly for helping that to happen, whether it's through the DPLA or through our advocacy or working with publishers on different models. I think that's a crucial piece of it. Um, but you know, as a parent of a six and a nine year old, um, maybe nothing. Right? I mean, there may be some degree to which I'm, we're still buying them the books or pick checking them out of the Enoch Pratt Library and reading them that book too. That may be how we want to, um, in our household, do it. So I think that the range of possibilities is enormous. And it's enormous, especially if we get the platform right and the community parts right um, to what the DPLA is. Um, and I happen to believe there are lots of things as a parent we can do, but I also think it's, um, it's not a replacement for anything and we shouldn't see it that way. If I could offer two, um, uh, this doesn't get to the lower end of the uh, age range that you're uh, asking about, but the University of Texas at Arlington did a study about a year and a half ago, and they were looking at, because students in Texas study Texas history in fourth grade and then in, again in seventh grade, and, um, and they were looking at what is it that's going to fully engage students in the study of our state's history. And, uh, and what's going to yield higher um, grades on standardized tests having to do with Texas history. Well, one of the things they found is that students performed better if they had a, a greater extent of uh, interaction with documents, with real documents, if they had first person experiences. And so what we've tried to do at the Texas State Library, and I know many state libraries around the country uh, have been funding projects at their own institution as well as across their individual states, that is bringing history to the classroom so that students can experience, rather than simply talking about the, um, our Civilian Conservation Corps uh, drawings of Texas uh, parks or, uh, or our Confederate pension applications or Texas Republic claims or any of the, the wealth of, of uh, documents that we have, um, we can digitize those and make them available so that it enhances the experience of students as they study our state's history. And of course that's very much true for the study of uh, United States history as well because that's used in classrooms at the youngest level, I think. So. so I think Carl has one last comment. Two very specific examples. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Life, which the Smithsonian helps do, pictures of bugs and lions and tigers and bears, and the amazing uh, folk song collections at the Library of Congress. And if we're successful to address uh, Professor Fisher's point, um, after being able to identify the lions and tigers and bears, the next thing out of that kid's mouth is going to be, I want to visit the Smithsonian when we go to Washington. Or the local zoo, right? Yeah, yep. and that, that's certainly been our experience. It's a, it's a means of getting people into that content 
not a replacement of the physical content. I wanted to mention that too. I've, I've read a number of studies about um, libraries and museums and archives doing digitization. Well, archives and museums particularly, and there's always this worry. It's going if we digitize it, people won't come to the physical place anymore. And there are many studies that it's exactly oh, the opposite. So people see it online. So this this phrase, you know, if it if it isn't online, it doesn't exist, is just sort of a little little catchphrase. But I think it it might be usefully complicated by saying if it isn't online, people don't know it exists. <coughs> Um, once it's online, people understand that it exists, and sure, maybe you're on the other side of the country not willing to make that trip, but when you do do your once-in-a-lifetime field trip to Washington, you yeah, they, take the opportunity yeah. to go look at that thing that you only saw online. Yeah. So let me close with two words of thanks. The first is on behalf of the panel to all of you, and particularly those of you who made comments or responded to the questions that I had posed. It was a very meaningful experience in engagement in this process, and you could also see from that that it stimulates thinking and it helps advance the development of the DPLA. And of course, I want all of you in the audience to join me in thanking the six panelists for their presentations. <laughs>